Well, good morning, everyone. And Mark, thank you very much uh, for your kind introduction. I'd like to thank the uh, Chamber of Commerce and our Convention Center for hosting this annual, annual review of the state of our city. And let me acknowledge my city council colleagues and our city administration led by city manager Martin Hayward. It's a great team. Most importantly, I want to thank the thousands of Londoners who are taking the time to participate in this great democratic tradition. Be you in the room today, tuning into the news tonight, or watching the event online during the weeks to come. You know, Henry Ford once observed, coming together is a beginning, keeping together is progress, working together is success. The power of working together is my central message today as I share my observations for where we are as a city, where we're headed, and how we can each contribute to London's success. So let's get started. This state of the city comes at a moment in history of global uncertainty that naturally makes many of us anxious. We look at the forces beyond our control and ask, what will be the impact on jobs as our provincial and federal governments trim costs to deal with large budget deficits? Will business or political decisions made outside our city lead to the types of job losses that were recently announced in Oshawa? Will we still be able to afford to live in our homes and apartments as interest rates continue to rise? And you know, these are thoughtful questions. They reflect not only global uncertainties, but changes closer to home. We have a new Ontario government, the next federal election soon to come, and a new city council less than 60 days in office. You know, I know the pain and fear of job loss and paying the bills. You know, I grew up poor as one of 13 people in a three-bedroom townhouse. And as a young man, I almost lost my home when interest rates soared back in 1981. Only Joe Preston will remember that far back, I think. And like many Londoners, I moved to our city not knowing anyone, driven by the need to survive and with hope for better days ahead. Now, a common practice these days seems to be warning of the dangers ahead by referencing the pain many of us felt during the Great Recession of a decade ago, when London's unemployment rate was double digits and our city's capital debt financing was a perilous 23%. We should not ignore such warnings. They keep us on our toes. But we must also not ignore a fundamental truth. The state of our city has significantly changed over these past 10 years. I'd ask you to consider these facts. Number one, our unemployment rate last year was 5.6%, the lowest in recent history. We ended the year even lower at 5%. Number two, our city finances are strong. Our budget is balanced and capital debt financing to maintain infrastructure was just 4% in 2018 a dramatic reduction versus the 23% of just a decade ago. Number three, our residential property taxes as a percentage of household income are now the fourth lowest of 25 Ontario cities with populations greater than 100,000. Number four, construction is booming. Did you know that for the third year in a row, city construction permits have exceeded $1 billion? What has not changed is the diversity of our economy. We are not a single industry city. Rather, we are a community of some 14,000 employers with our quarter of our jobs in the stable public institutions, such as schools and hospitals, and with no private firm accounting for more than 1.6% of all London jobs. The stability of our economy, combined with the strength of our city's financial management, are fundamental reasons why Moody's has given its highest credit rating, AAA, for the 42nd year in a row. And I think that our city uh, management and leadership there deserves a great acknowledgement for that record. <laughs> and it is why our economy has recovered so well across the past 10 years. And it is an important draw for new business. Case in point, Maple Leaf Foods, which in two years will in London, opened the largest and most technically sophisticated processing plant in their history and will employ more than 1,400 London area citizens. 
We are joined today by Maple Leaf Senior Vice President of Government and Industry Relations, Rory McAlpine, and Vice President, Poultry Strategy, Lou Kappa. I would ask these gentlemen to please stand as we give you a warm London welcome. So when we put this all together, the conclusion is unmistakable. Our economic performance and diversified job base are achievements that any city of any size in any country on this planet would be proud to call their own. In a word, the state of our city is strong. The strength of our city is reflected in the achievements of our citizens across the past year. So when I asked city staff to gather highlights, they quickly assembled a list of hundreds. All are worthy of recognition, but time allows for, allows for just a few to be highlighted. So with thanks to all in London who have moved London forward in 2018, here's an illustration of the work we did together. Number one, our first responders have kept us safe. To illustrate, the most recent municipal benchmarking network report shows London as Canada's best amongst eight comparable cities in terms of fire station response time, and second lowest in per capita fire-related deaths. Number two, Fanshawe College helped fill our jobs and revitalize our downtown. Fanshawe was, was ranked number one among large Ontario colleges for the percent of students who graduate and number two for their percent of graduates finding employment. In 2018, as you know, Fanshawe opened the college's school of Information, Technology and Tourism, Hospitality and Culinary Arts on Dundas Street. The college's three downtown locations now bring more than 2,500 students to our city's core each day. Number three, Tourism London and our city's top entertainers and athletes continue to bring tourism dollars to London and thrills to us all. In 2018, and you will know this, London hosted the Ontario Summer Games the Continental Cup of Curling, the Canadian Tire Para Hockey World Challenge, dozens of cultural events, and was named the city, the host city for this year's Juno Awards. The London Lightning were Canadian basketball champions. I'm purple and proud, and Western's football squad made a repeat appearance at the Vanier Cup, and Tessa, Scott, uh, Tessa and Scott were crowned Olympic ice skating champions. Lighting, Lightning owner Vito Frigia Tourism London, Cheryl Finn, and Juno's host committee chair, Chris Campbell, have joined us today. And I'd ask you to join me as I ask them to stand to be recognized by your hometown fans. <laughs> Number four, London's planning, engineering, and construction talents came together to show us how we can create our future while respecting our past. I was with Councillor Kayabog on our very first day when, of, of, uh, of office when London's historic Blackfriars Bridge reopened last month, providing easier access to our downtown for cars, cyclists, and pedestrians. And our city joined forces with the London Library and the YMCA to open the Bostwick Community Centre. Bostwick has become a spectacular success and a gathering spot for residents in southwest London, even more important. It is the anchor for a new half billion dollar residential and office complex that our previous city council approved just two months ago. Number five, London's medical community helped keep us and the world healthier. The Middlesex London Health Unit, recognizing that our city has one of Canada's largest populations of people who inject drugs, opened a temporary consumption and treatment service last February. In its first 10 months of operation, did you know the center handled 11,000 visits? It saved 65 lives and connected more than 200 drug users to addictions treatment. Also in the area of opioid addiction, a team of researchers at the Lawson Health Research Institute and Western University developed a new clinical protocol called Stop Narcotics, which reduces the amount of pain medication prescribed after surgery by 50%. Through these efforts and many more, Lawson was ranked among Canada's best hospital research institutes in 2018. Now, there'll be many of you who are itching to shout out, how about the stuff that isn't working? Well, you're absolutely right. While the state of our city is strong, 
and the accomplishments of our citizens remarkable, our work together is far from done. Over the next three months, City Council will complete a strategic plan which will de define the priorities of city government over the next four years. Shortly after that, we will develop and approve a matching four-year budget. Our strongest plan and our most successful implementations will, will come by bringing the best of our collective experiences together. Not just those on council, but all Londoners. You might say, well, no one asks me for my opinion. Okay, so here's my personal invitation to you. Get involved. Bring your input to the strategic plan through your surveys of open houses, public participation meetings that will take place over this next month. And continue to let your voice be heard by meeting with your ward councillor, they're all here today, and attending city council meetings. And you want to have an even bigger impact? Do this as a group. The bigger and more diverse, the better. The views of multiple stakeholders thoughtfully coming together behind a worthy cause almost always grabs the attention of city council and the media. So since we have all the voices, let me kick off this process by sharing my priorities for the four-year plan. Number one, refocusing our primary job efforts from more employers to more employee employed. I remain strongly supportive of new investments in London, be they from the new businesses or from local firms such as Gateway Casinos, whose expansion plans are now crystallizing. These new projects are exciting. We must not, however, lose sight of the important truth. The and you know this well, the primary restriction to growth for London, as it is for most cities, is the ability for our businesses to hire enough qualified workers. Some of the skills required are quite advanced, but most unfilled jobs simply require a good work ethic and a willingness to learn. Therefore, my top priority is to refocus our primary job efforts on filling the openings that are available today. So how do we fill those jobs in the face of record low unemployment rate? One answer lies in the large number of London unemployed who do not appear to be looking for a job and are therefore not included in the unemployment rate. We call the total of people without jobs, those actively seeking work and those not, are not employed rate. When we include all Londoners ages 25 to 64 who are not working, London's not employed rate is a staggering 28%. That rate is the highest of 10 similarly sized city, cities in Ontario. More meaningfully, that translates roughly to 77,000 Londoners in their prime working years who don't have a job. Now you might be thinking there are a lot of reasons why those 77,000 Londoners aren't working, and I would agree. Many Londoners are going to school or retired. It is why I restricted my number to those within their prime working years of ages 25 to 64. Some Londoners are not able to work due to health or other personal reasons, while others have chosen for various reasons not to work. That is why I have, I have compared our not employed rate to that of 10 similarly sized cities in Ontario, tracked by Statistics Canada. They all face similar employment challenges and London's job performance should at least match theirs. Today it does not, but we can and we will change that. If we were to lower our not employed rate to the average of those 10 cities, we would put 13,000 more Londoners to work. We'd almost double that if we matched the best cities. But imagine 13,000 more employed is a massive number. It is the job equivalent of bringing 13 big businesses to London. And we have the jobs. Stats Canada reports that there are almost 9,000 openings in the London economic region today. And we anticipate thousands of new jobs to open within the next two years. Imagine the positive impacts on London's families and businesses on filling those jobs we'd give our city wings to fly, and we'd be the role model for cities across Canada and beyond. Better tapping into our talent base is critically important. Leaders from across London agree. In fact, we have formed a task force called London Jobs Now to, to more effectively connect London job seekers to our employers. My office has, with enthusiasm, made the commitment to lead the group. We are joined by the London Economic Development Corporation, London's Chamber of Commerce, the London Region Manufacturing Council, London Social Services, Fanshawe College, 
Western University, and our first private sector firm, Nestle Canada, who is today looking for 300 employees today. Today we're asking you, though, to join us. Send us an email to jobs at london.ca. Be part of the solution. The second thing, we must better address the needs of our most vulnerable. We are seeing these strains of London's not employed on our social system. First, we have too many people living in poverty. The 2018 Vital Science Report commissioned by the London Community Foundation shows that 70,000 Londoners live in poverty, including one in four children. We have the third highest child poverty rate in Canada. Second, we have too many without affordable housing. Our wait list for social housing continues to grow. It now stands at 4,770 Londoners, up 34% versus last year. Third, we have too many being harmed by drug addiction. London has the sixth highest rate of opioid-related hospitalizations in our country. These problems are found across our city, but perhaps the greatest concern from those Londoners who spend time in our downtown core. Some say, get those people off the street, but fail to suggest where. We cannot and will not simply move our most vulnerable out of sight. But this is a complex problem. In the long run, we must address difficult issues, more jobs for those able to work, more social housing and related support services, and more addiction treatment services. The solutions are large enough that we'll need and we'll seek funding support from the provincial and federal governments. But there's work we can do locally. The London Jobs Now program is one step. And I'm pleased to report that work has been started by city staff and community partners through the recent launch of a collaborative downtown pilot called Informed Response. My hope is that we can take the learning from this pilot and later this year extend and broaden compassionate care for our most vulnerable. Number three, accelerating the transportation, transportation decisions that will more reliably get Londoners to work and school on time. Londoners agree that it's time to end our city's impasse on the bus rapid transit plan. Our provincial and federal governments agree. The Ontario government has now said that they have earmarked $170 million to provide transportation infrastructure projects in London. And in addition, Ottawa has reconfirmed its $204 million contribution once London prepares and the Ontario government approves specific plans for how we will use those funds. Both governments have made clear that they are supportive of transportation infrastructure, pro infrastructure projects that might lie inside or outside of the current BRT plan and the decisions on which projects to propose rests squarely with London's City Council. To be clear, neither of these commitments are blank checks. As we would expect, specific projects must be accompanied by plans that detail how the money will be spent. City staff will be essential in the process, both in working with our council and with their engineering and finance counterparts at Queen's Park and Ottawa. But there is a time clock to this work that all Londoners need to understand. While we will not be rushed into poor decisions, we must be aware that the fall federal election will delay projects that only come up for approval starting in the summer. Accordingly, with the province's support, I am today encouraging City Council to work together to identify major projects that we can bring to the Ontario government within the next 60 days. We may not have consensus on all the projects within that period, but can and should kickstart a number that can significantly help all Londoners. While this infrastructure work is progressing, we must move to improve the reliability of bus service to get Londoners to work and school on time. We'll start with the industrial areas and add as needed services to the new Maple Leaf plant and rapidly growing residential areas within our city. We must as a city encourage and support London Transit as they work to get this done on our behalf. Number four, working to keep our city safe. Although London remains a safe city, the number of crimes and the associated police response times are increasing significantly as a result. Our spending with the police is the largest component of our London's budget, and we cannot afford to spend our way to a solution, but we can work together to find smarter ways to increase public safety. Two examples come to mind. First, a significant drain on police resources relates to drug and mental health issues, particularly the significant time spent by officers in hospitals as they wait for patients to be admitted. 
The police chiefs of Ontario are working with the province on a proposal to, to dramatically cut police officer waiting times in hospitals so that we can keep more feet on the street. I strongly support them in that effort. Second, working together is also the only way we will address and solve the challenge of, of what has become an increasingly dangerous and disruptive weekend, the Bruffdale Street Party near Western University. Last year, dozens of students were taken to hospital and dozens of police officers were called upon to control the crowd. The city, Western, Western Student Union, and emergency services have formed a task force to face the problem head on. The task force will issue its report by April 30th, and I will strongly support the task force at Western's Board of Governors, to which I've recently been appointed. Number five, streamlining our city's construction permits and approvals process. Last year, London's private sector's investments in residential and commercial construction exceeded the entire city hall operating budget. And with multiple new projects on the books, such as the just announced development at the London Psychiatric Hospital lands, that trend will continue. Our city government has done a very good job in managing our growth through our planning process. We also have a comprehensive set of bylaws to keep construction safe and our city livable. Now we've heard from some builders and developers, however, that it's not always easy to do business with our city. Our reviews can take too long and our decisions sometimes go beyond the bylaws that we have put in place. But our city government recognizes this and in 2018 made changes to streamline processes and bring city teams who perform similar functions together so that they can better serve our builders and developers and our citizens. We will continue to make improvements during the year ahead. And while we tackle these city-specific priorities, let me leave you each with a final challenge. It's time to expand our view of London's role within Ontario, Canada, and the world. Many of you know the work of Richard Florida, a global authority on how cities succeed. A basic premise of his work is the rise of mega regions as the global economy replacement to cities, as the fundamental economic unit of our time. Did you know that Florida has ident identified 40 mega regions in the world? The 12th largest with a population of 22 million and, a, and an economy of more than half a trillion dollars is the London, Quebec City, Buffalo Triangle. That's right. Florida has identified specifically London, Ontario as the Western terminus to the world's 12th largest economy. And we'll throw in St. Thomas just for fun, Joe. I believe that many Londoners see it that way. We tend to think of ourselves sometimes as the London region or the Southwest Ontario region. A broader view won't change the day-to-day -day -day work that keeps our city humming, but it will allow us to think more powerfully in terms of what industries we target, how to better connect to the rest of our mega region, and the value that London, Ontario can bring to our province and our country. A clear starting point is higher speed train service between London and Toronto. Getting this done will allow London and Ontario to reap the benefits of a more closely integrated mega region. We've covered a lot of ground, so let me recap. The state of our city is strong. The hard work and achievements of Londoners are exceptional. We, like all cities, have problems we must address in order to improve the quality of life for all. Your city council will, across the next few months, complete a four-year plan and associated budget that will prioritize which tasks we address. And I'm inviting you and all London citizens to actively engage in this process. My top priority, which impacts all the others, is to focus our efforts on filling current job openings and in so doing, putting 13,000 more Londoners to work. My central message though is less about what we do and about how we do it. I began with a quote from Henry Ford on the importance of working together. Let me end with a quote from the late uh, Prime Minister Lester Pearson on the same theme, where he said, live together in confidence and cohesion, with more faith and pride in ourselves and less self-doubt and hesitation, strong in the conviction that the destiny of Canada is to unite, not divide, sharing in cooperation, not in separation or in conflict, respecting our past and welcoming our future. That is our opportunity, that is our challenge that we can do. So I thank you all for being here today. I thank you all for what you do for London. Let's embrace the years ahead as we move London forward. Thank you very much.